Hello and welcome to News Click. We are joined today by Ambassador Bhadra Kumar, and we are going to discuss the recent unbleeped record of the tape discussions that took place with Nixon and Kissinger with respect to Mrs. Gandhi's visit in 1971 or his other discussions regarding Mrs. Gandhi. Now, this has been public knowledge for some time. The specific words may not have been there, but that they called her a bitch, a witch, bast Indians as bastards, this has all been there. So in that sense, what is only new is the vitriol that has been displayed in more vitriol that's been displayed than we learned about earlier. But in overall terms, is there anything new that you see in this, uh, in this uh, what has been disclosed recently? I think it was very, very personal. I think, you know, that's that part of it. It seems she was threatened by her. And therefore, a lot of these remarks make sense only in that context. Yeah, but you know, the man is like that, you know, I mean, he has a reputation of, you know, speaking, throwing expletives, you know, in his conversation at the rate of, you know, at least half a dozen times a, a minute, you know, this is the kind of man he is, He's an he was an alcoholic. And uh, so um, it's nothing very really surprising in terms of his uh, personality. It's very well known, as you said in the beginning. In fact, you know, certain about alcoholic, it's important yeah. that Kissinger had given instructions to the military that if he issues an order for any military attack, including nuclear attack at night, it should not be acted upon without being consulted with him because he could do it because he was drunk. And in uh -huh. fact, it's, it's said that he did issue orders for certain attacks of this kind. It, it is uh, drunken rage at night. He, he, he was uh, uh, most of the time under the uh, effect of alcohol, you know, and uh, and then in the towards the end, you know, when all that Watergate and all uh, erupted, uh, it was uncontrollable. I mean, he was all the time hitting the bottle, you know. <laughs> this is a kind of thing which we know also from uh, obviously, you know, Kissinger also remarked later. Kissinger never. Uh, Kissinger is a very intelligent man, and you know, his predicament was that you know. He was dealing with a boss, you know, who was so inferior to him in intellect. So it's very difficult for a man with such high IQ to serve under a man who is a mediocre fellow. <laughs> so most of the time, Kissinger's problem was that. But uh, Prabir, in, uh, seriously, one or two things strike me here. Now, I come to the part, uh, one thing, of course, you know, we all, uh, at the beginning itself, you know, we all uh, can agree on this, that uh, uh, there is much... Truth in also what much truth in the sense that you know that it is uh, it is possible also uh, to understand these uh, acerbic remarks completely unacceptable to an Indian, but uh, acerbic remarks from a different perspective because uh, you cannot deny the fact that uh, this is also their uh, understanding of the Indian bourgeoisie, you know, really. Uh, you see, uh, despite the fact that uh, the Americans uh, were never really interested in building up India and uh, this whole uh, approach to India that you are, so long as you are in the uh, non-aligned country, you are uh, on adversarial, we are on adversarial terms with you, you are not part of us, you know, you are either with us or against us. That uh, dogma was even at that time there. But despite this, uh, I think is even going back to Pandit Nehru's time, the uh, Indian establishment uh, always behaved in a sort of craven way, you know, for uh, acceptance by the Americans, recognition by the Americans. And uh, having been a diplomat who served in the Soviet Union, I can tell you this, that I, I really wonder many times, you know, whether the Indian bourgeoisie was never really, was ever really interested in a uh, friendly, cooperative, strategic partnership with the Soviet Union, you know. So it was in my judgment, looking back, I can tell you my judgment uh, after reflecting over it for a long time and deeply and knowing a lot of other details which I cannot divulge, I think it was by force of circumstances. And uh, the credit must be given to the Americans that uh, they could fathom this, you know, and so therefore they could deal with India as they liked. Like uh, even in the case of, you know, non-alignment, uh, Nehru speaks about then, but the fact remains that, you know, in the second half of the 1950s, uh, we had a tie-up with the CIA in regard of Tibet, you know. That's uh, public knowledge now. Uh, yeah, which finally... There's yeah. the insurrection in uh, Tibet, which was financed yeah. and supported by the CIA, could not have taken place. 
No, shall I tell you something? You know, which you I don't think you are aware of this because this is still you know I mean not very much in the public domain. But you know, documents have come out. It's been written about. One of the first cables that the American ambassador in Delhi filed to Washington after India became a republic, you know, after the British left and you know we are on our own, you know, in 1950, the cable by the American ambassador was in fact proposing to the United States, to Washington, to the uh, then administration, that uh, he saw there's great scope after talking to uh, Indian leadership. Uh, and he had very free access that he saw great scope for uh, india and uh, united states for united states working with india and uh, making use of india's help to destabilize china and you refer to tibet you know and now this is actually uh, this thing which is in my custody personal custody in my archives is in fact you know mostly copiously quoting from American sources, you know, from cable traffic and so on between the embassy. So you see, this is a, what you have mentioned about this Dalai Lama's flight and all that is a culmination of it, you know. And we know very well that uh, this is one template uh, which uh, uh, severely damaged the mutual trust between China and India. This is Mao's time we are talking about. So you see the American, you, we have to see this Nixon remarks uh, in the totality of things in terms of, you know, after all, he was the president of the United States and he has a complete access to the archival memory about the Indian leadership and Indira Gandhi was not new to them. They knew her, they knew her father and when her father made, you know, his uh, historic visit to the United States, she was actually going with him as, uh, you know, the hostess, you know, so they knew the person very well. So uh, when a visit like this took place, when a visit like this takes place, like Indira Gandhi's visit to the White House, naturally the president is very well briefed on it, on the character of the person, on her bio profile, and on Indian as Indians as such, and you know their our peculiarities and national characteristics and all that. So all foreign officers do this. So. We cannot be, because he made, you know, certain type of uh, cheap remarks like this on sex and Indian women and all that, uh, their reproductive capacity and all that, uh, you know, we tend to look at it and, you know, no, I, rubbish I, it. I, I, I'm <laughs> going to also take up a different strand on this. This remark is very similar to, for instance, what Churchill says about India. India's breathed too much. How did they become five, 500 million is what? Nixon is supposed to have said, but forget all of that. But I, let me also to talk to talk to you about something else that there is, there has been something which we have not seemed to have understood about the United States that there is a deep streak of white supremacist or racial superiority with which it also foreign policy is imbued, and it's a part of the larger colonial enterprise with which it hitches hitch itself after uh, the Second World War, supporting the ex-colonial powers. They were still colonial powers. In fact, the French in, in the China, you have the Portuguese and the Sp Spaniards, Portuguese, of course, in India as well, and the Spaniards and Portuguese in Africa, the French, we have already discussed, Dutch in Indonesia, and therefore, non-alignment was also an anti-imperialist, at least decolonization project. While they did FTSE with the Americans, the Indian establishment did that as you were recounting. But also there was a larger issue that there was a decolonization process and India did take a position using non-alignment in order to support decolonization in different parts of the world, which is what actually sets its against American policies. Portugal and Goa is, of course, the classic example, but the Adlai Stevenson, the liberal American uh, candidate at one point for US presidency, he actually presses for uh, the Security Council resolution, say, doesn't mention about colony, colonialism or colonial possessions at all, saying, Portugal and India have to negotiate under the United Secure Nations uh, Council's uh, guidelines and they cannot decolonize Portugal, but decolonize Portuguese colonies by force. So there is also that history where India does come in or India's international policies come into conflict with how the US wanted it to be played. You know, without uh, 
rejecting what you said, let me just sidestep it. You know, that uh, if we purely look at it through that prism, it becomes problematic to, for us, you know, uh, when we recollect that uh, Stalin was much more uh, in a condemnatory tone about the Indian leadership at the time of independence. Let's not forget that. You know, he, uh, of course, they were very much aware of the fact of, uh, you know, this national liberation movements taking place all over the world. And the quintessentially Indian freedom struggle was about, uh, you know, about evicting the uh, Imperial Britain from this, uh, not only the, our country, but eventually, you know, as it happened from this whole part of the world and, uh, you know, subsequent to which, you know, the decline of Britain even began. But, you know, the, I'm not, uh, as I told you, I'm not uh, disowning what you said, but uh, let us face it that, you know, sometimes when we look at the mirror, it becomes difficult for us because the image we see there is not the image that we like and what we think of ourselves, what you would like others to think of us, you know. And in, uh, I look at it from that point of view, you know, that uh, can you, can you uh, overlook the fact that when Kashmir issue was uh, taken to the United Nations and uh, so on, we never sought Soviet Union's help. All those resolutions which were passed, etc. We are not. We, we, we really didn't take Soviet help, and that was a personal initiative by the then ambassador, Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan, who had an arrangement to serve in Moscow for six months and then teach in Oxford for the remaining six months. And Nehru agreed with that arrangement, and he used to visit Moscow, you know, for his assignment once in a way. And at that time, in one of his meetings with Vishnevsky, Stalin's uh, famous foreign minister, Radhakrishnan was his subject. And when Vishnevsky spoke about, you know, the warm feelings towards the Indian people and all that, he rose the subject. And uh, then Radhakrishnan said, if you have such warm sentiments, why is it that you don't uh, support us in the Security Council on these resolutions? Don't you see that this Anglo-American conspiracy against us and so on and so forth? And then, you know, he just, uh, Vishnevsky, Vishnevsky just uh, looked at him straight. And uh, he said, this uh, answer is simple. You never ask for it, you know. And then Radhakrishnan said, I am asking, well, I am asking you for this. So he again looked at him and said that, uh, uh, you know, is, uh, are you sure about this? So he said, yes. And then he reported to Stalin and the first Soviet veto followed, you know. So you see, there's this a whole which history. Year? This is which, Sorry? which year was this? The time of uh, Radha Krishnan's time there, 1950, something like that, you know. Which, and now, you know, the point, the point is what I'm trying to say is that, you know, that uh, the, uh, there was never a time when, you know, Americans were uh, suffering from a loss of influence in Delhi. Even amongst uh, Indira Gandhi's crowd, there were people who were unabashedly pro-American. And if at that time there was anything like Quad, you know, of today's quadrilateral alliance, and an offer was made like that, I am sure, you know, that a fair chunk of the Indian establishment at that time would have also jumped into that bandwagon. That is the point I was coming to. They are so there has always been a strong element of... You know, you are, you, you are speaking about it as a man of strong convictions about the flow of history. And in terms of the historical forces that are at work and where India stands in that uh, stream, I told you that I'm not rejecting it. It's quite valid. But uh, when we analyze this particular piece of journalism, which came in the New York Times, we, have, we cannot be oblivious of the fact that we have presented ourselves in a certain way in these important Western capitals after our independence. And we, not, we don't like it, what, what they are talking about us. Now, Kissinger's remark, for instance, he was not an alcoholic. And he is a very rational man. He's a very intelligent man. And uh, you see what he has said there? He has said about Indian character. And he said, you know, that uh, this is how they survived through this period of Mughal rule and uh, British rule. How? By, you know, sucking up. That's a word he said. It's a, it's a very strong expression. Sucking up to more superior forces. Now, this is the uh, flow of Indian history and Indian civilization and about the national character of the Indian elites. That intelligent, erudite minds in the Western world have come to understand in, a, in this way. We, we are saddled with that impression. And I don't think it has substantially changed even now. Now look, for example, 
Trump has lots of adversaries in the world. Has he insulted any adversary like this, like he has, he has insulted our prime minister? I'm not trying to, uh, you know, impute any motives there. But, you know, all these things, you know, whether it is about... What the thing is that they take it for granted. Even they if take it for granted and then, then we yes, still go they back know, to them. They know that we still go back. And that, you know, that uh, they, they don't, we don't mind if we are being treated as a doormat. You know, this has been, this has been all along, you know, a certain, there's a certain behavioral pattern here. That's what I'm trying to say. So well, you're saying that a section of the Indian elite, or at least in the foreign policy establishment, Indian government, as well as we know, in the Indian security establishment, has been pro-American right from the beginning. And that these are the forces who today are actually becoming more powerful. Is there any doubt about it? You know, the Americans, we know very well, the Americans had sources right within the Indian cabinet all along, isn't it? Many, many a time, many a name surfaced. And even today, for example, objectively speaking, you see this, that, you know, that I wrote a couple of days ago about this matter, that they are all rooting for this quad, quadrilateral alliance, and India to chair a meeting, ministerial meeting in Delhi. Has there been any national debate over this subject? You know, this is a very profound turning point for Indian foreign policy and diplomacy. Now, is there anything like that? And, and that too, when the, we get to know from the Americans that this is already being discussed like this, and this is going to be this fall. This fall means what? At a time when the American administration is in transition. How do these people know that, you know, that this is going to be, you know, the prioritization of the American foreign policy is going to be on these lines that we conjecture today? There is no certainty. So why do we do this? And then again, we know very well that this Quad has no takers in our region other than United States' Anglo-Saxon outpost, Australia, and Japan. And what about and the, no, what the Australia, nations? Australia, what about Australia is a complete outsider anyway. What, but, what, about the, what about the natives? The natives of the region. If you look at them, nobody has accepted, nobody has shown interest. ASEAN has cold-shouldered this. Now, why does, islands. why does this happen? Without a na serious national debate in the country, very stealthily this takes place because this means aligning with the Americans. And I mean, we don't have the time. Otherwise, you know, uh, we can also relate this as a factor complicating India's relationship with China. And a number of things which are going on today, which are very depressing for us, you know, uh, patriotic Indians, you know, because the country has come to such a crisis today. And now a number of these things, you know, are only possible to understand because a clutch of these people still within the Indian establishment can hijack the country in this direction. Now this, I don't think this began today. This has been all along the case. And then uh, be, as a rational mind, you have explained about the national liberation moments and about the historical forces at work. Similarly, historical forces are at work, and today in Ladakh, I'm 100% telling you the Americans are not going to fight the Chinese there for us, nor are the Australians, nor the Japanese, nobody. We are on our own. So historical forces are at work, and finally course correction is needed, and course correction takes place, and whether it is in 1971 and whether it is in 2020, this is what is happening in our country. So I, I only said this that I do not reject. I have serious, um, I have a serious sense of hurt when I read this news item. No, I know but what you're saying. As a rational, but you know, while I completely agree with what the broader point you're making, that there have been sections in the Indian establishment who wanted alliance with the United States. The sections are known. Uh, Moraji Desai was one of them, open about it. There's nothing hidden in what. He was well, positioning himself as and the huge number of others as well. And also strong sections in the Indian bureaucracy, as I said, the security establishment. But there are, as you said also, the historical forces which also made it possible or made it difficult for those forces to bring completely India under the US umbrella, as a lot of them want. Now, it would be geopolitical reasons and also the legacy of the Indian national movement, which was the decolonizing movement. So it is, there is a solidarity between, for instance, Socarno 
and his fight with the Dutch. I remember Nehru asking uh, uh, Biju Patnaik to go and rescue uh, Sokarno when he was surrounded by Dutch forces. So there are also this physical acts of solidarity which takes place. So the non-aligned movement in that sense had also a certain salience in Indian policy. And it's only now that people have started saying openly there is nothing called non-alignment, it doesn't exist, and we should look at our security interests ourselves. And some total of that is to align with the United States. When the United States is not in Asia, as you said, there are no Asian takers except for Australia. I don't know how they become in this part of the world. And Japan. And Japan is, in that sense, a marginal player in the larger Asian chessboard. Yeah, you know, the uh, point I want to make is this, you know, that uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, at this point in time, when you look back, the experience is not really very different from in 1971, isn't it? You know, uh, faced with a situation such as here today. Now here, you know, we are also putting, in fact, the Russians in a predicament. And that is because, again, a clutch of people are taking India to a camp, which is uh, very difficult for time-tested friends like Russians or Chinese or, uh, or, or uh, Iranians are possible to accept. We have uh, all those countries are, you know, uh, looking with a great sense of disappointment and hurt about, you know, this, what is happening to Indian foreign policy today. But they're doing that. And the, uh, the, the problem is, you know, they are so very cynical about it that this quad, if you look at it today, and you compare it with what Prime Minister Narendra Modi said in his keynote address at the Shangri-La conference in Singapore on the 1st of June 2018. You don't know what the Indian policy is. So you see, there is, a, there is even a kind of a duplicity, a, a double speak. So you speak one thing and then you quietly go and do something else. That is what it is coming to again. Is a quad is a complete negation of what uh, Prime Minister Modi said in uh, in uh, Singapore, and here the so it means that you know that there is something going on we don't know whether there is no daylight possible between Prime Minister and the External Affairs Minister or people are some people are pursuing their own agenda we don't know, but uh, w what really struck me from this uh, report this Nixon Kissinger report is this that you know that uh, uh, this is something which was very much in evidence even at that time and you know Indira Gandhi's visit at that time to the White House in fact you know was to get uh, American help you know and uh, when uh, we should have known very clearly that uh, that there is no meeting point possible that they are not going to come to our help but we no, are still want to, to neutralize that they don't attack us and uh, in that if you remember, this is one month before actual war broke out. And that is when Nixon really ranted and raved about how she has fooled us and so on. And then gave instructions to the Sixth Fleet to proceed towards South Asia. Uh, for whatever reasons uh, we are not aware of, but clearly as a threat to India. That was the whole uh, movement. This is this meeting took place a month before actual war broke out. So that was the context. And it's also interesting that Nixon thought that he had dissuaded her from a war. And his, her, his basic anger was that she had, in spite of that, declared uh, the liberation war, war of, to free Bangladesh, whichever way you call it, but that, that India and Pakistan did go to war. And let's face it, India did go to war on this issue of Bangladesh. So that was the real anger. Uh, but it's interesting what you were saying is that they expected India to fall in line. And at the moment, that, that was because of their history and their understanding of the Indian elite. They thought that this is something that would work as America, big brother, telling them the US, India would not dare to do it. Uh, just to uh, sidestep to another case, for example, the American intervention in uh, Iraq. 
uh, at that time, you know, that uh, it's very difficult to speak these things, uh, you know, publicly like this in such a vein. But, you know, there is at the highest level of the then Indian government, Bajpayee government, there was a line of thinking that uh, we should respond to the overture, the, 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 the request made by the uh, Bush administration, Rumsfeld met, in fact, then Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Adwani, that, you know, India, an Indian contingent. And, you know, uh, according to our media reports, I have no Western knowledge, but according to Indian media reports, a Indian, Indian army was in fact instructed to get ready for an intervention there. And then uh, from what we know, Prime Minister uh, Bajpayee decided that this is not going to be something which will have national acceptability. As an earthy politician who knew his people very well and who prioritized that, you know, that a nation, he must should be able to carry the nation along, he rejected this idea. But a very powerful section of the Indian establishment, and even including our media, and there are some living people, so I don't want to mention, one of them, in fact, was an editor. He even wrote, and I have still got it in my uh, archives. He wrote that if you don't send Indian forces to Iraq, uh, in deference to the demand made by the Bush administration, wait for a catastrophic outcome in the downstream. They are going to take Kashmir away from us. Did anything of that sort happen? So you see, whipping up jingoism on one side, whipping up paranoia on one side, because you know, these are all very uh, subjective, impetuous movements. And there is no way they can justify this, rationalize this. Now, of course, again, it is the same thing that, you know, that how do you justify a, a platform that has no local standard in that region among the natives of the uh, region nations who live there in that region. And all because the Americans want a certain type of polarization here. What do you get out of it? Who stands to gain? What does India get out of it? So, you know, so interesting. South China Sea is actually near the sea coast of China, Philippines, Vietnam. It's not at the borders close to Japan, Australia, <laughs> India. So, and US, of course, is 9,000 miles away from that. So on what basis are we talking about the Quad and supporting South China Sea, American fleet to move in over there, which is what it at the moment is. So this, this does show Indian, what you said earlier, that Indian vision, whether in Shangri-La or in Quad, does not seem to have geostrategic coherence. What is our geostrategic vision itself doesn't seem to be there in the Modi government. Well, you know, the, uh, the tragedy here is this, that, you know, that uh, all this would be acceptable, you know, probably in a situation where Congress party has undergone a change, you know, its character. So you can attribute a number of things um, to those Congress governments which pursued this sort of a line. But I cannot understand and I cannot forgive a nationalist government doing this. You know. At least I would imagine that a nationalist government would look at these issues like Quad and so on through just one prism. Well, let me share, you, share with you what I understood the nationalist prism in the sense of the RSS, the BJP now, at that time Johnson prism to be, which was told to be. I was, as you know, in jail with a number of their leaders. And they said that our understanding is Hindus, Christians against Muslims and communists. This is the basis of our foreign policy. So you have it in absolute brutal terms. Hindus and Christian United States, NATO, European powers, have a common interest against Muslims and communists. And extension of that is really China. Today. That's how they perceive. So there is no multipolarity in the world? Not in this prism. Uh, that's what I'm saying. So, you know, can you, can you imagine how can a country, this is why I said that I find it difficult to follow this, you know, this definition of nationalism. My definition of nationalism is different. My definition of nationalism is to, and I'm an incorrigible nationalist, I can tell you, that I in, insist on looking at anything and everything that appears in front of me on my computer in terms of India's interests. I, I, I reduce it down to that, you know. Now, I would imagine that an organization must, like RSS, which is even propagating this ideology which I subscribe to, you know, uh, ostensibly believing in it, 
uh, I mean, I can't understand, you know, how they can pursue such a kind of a division of the world. You know, the uh, fact is there is a multipolarity today. And the fact is there are independent centers of power which have appeared in the world. And the fact is that, you know, India has a lot of space today in the current international environment if we had wanted to work on it and optimally create space for us to maneuver in terms of the benefits that we can take out of the international situation for the real, real, real agenda, which is development, lifting hundreds of millions of Indians out of poverty. You know, this is a kind of thing. And now this is a nationalist agenda for India today. And in foreign policy, ultimately, it should be devoted to this completely. We speak about countries, you know, which are close to us, you know, with, with which we work very closely. Where is a country which, you know, looks at uh, geopolitics as an esoteric pass game like this, like you said, that, you know, if it is against Muslims or if it is against communists, etc. Is this, this kind of esoteric pastimes, you know, what happens is these are yesterday's men and they get left behind. And in the process, the country misses the journey. And today what is happening is that the country is going to miss the journey and we are going to lose something like five to 10 years of uh, the development trajectory. Now, is this nationalism? I think these are anti-nationals, you know, who are missing out on these realities. Thank you, Ambassador Bhadra Kumar, for being with us and discussing the issues, not to portray it narrowly in terms of Nixon versus Mrs. Gandhi, Kissinger versus X, Y, Z, but really in terms of how we should look at the world, how we should look at national interest, and how do you define it with a certain degree of understanding of the world. We'll come back to you on this and other issues. I'm sure that these things will come up time and again. This is all the time we have in News Click today. Do keep watching News Click and do visit our website. Thank you.